One of the challenges of running any infrastructure operation in 2024 is how to deal with weather. And that's why I was delighted to be invited to come and spend a day out on the railway with Nick Millington. Nick is Network Rail's route director for Wales and Borders. I learned about uh, flood attenuation, uh, I learned about uh, vegetation control, and surprisingly, about dormice. First off, we visited Chipping Sodbury on the Great Western Main Line between Swindon and Bristol Parkway. Nick introduced me to Julie Gregory, the Senior Programme Manager in the Climate Change Task Force in Network Rail's Wales and Western Region. We're here at Chipping Sodbury, so, so what we're looking at, well, apart from <laughs> a large hole, this is, this is a lagoon though, and this is a relatively recent investment? Yeah, yeah, so um, this is 2018, we um, built this lagoon, we extended it, yeah. so it's now 11 million litres. Um, yeah, so it holds the water um, instead of it being on the track, so it basically stops the track flooding. Um, you've got this model of, can you just explain a little bit about that and how that is actually helping in terms of, you know, sort of prevention and planning and, and, and keeping the railway running. The tool's called Gusto, which right. stands for Gales. As the wind picks <laughs> up, right, yeah. It stands for Gales, use of speed restrictions, targeted to operational risk. Right. So previous to Gusto, we would put on um, a speed restriction, 50 miles an hour for all trains. Right, when we flank have, it. Flank it, yeah, right. when we have gale force winds. So it's completely indiscriminate. Um, but actually, out there on the railway, we've got very much a variable risk. Yeah. So some places we're in a deep cutting, heavily heavily wooded. Um, it may be that it's perpendicular to the prevailing wind. So if trees right. fall, they're going to be onto the railway. So all those things contribute to a high risk from um, trees falling on the line in, in gale force winds. But other areas, you've got open fields, or yeah. it's, maybe it's a very urban area. Um, so the risk is much lower. So. Um, Gusto looks at all those risk factors and calculates kind of the sections where we've got the highest risk. When the forecast comes in, we can say, right, we're just going to put it onto these specific targeted areas. And then keep the rest open keep without speed restrictions. That's rest. brilliant. I think what we, what we need to get better at probably is knowing when the confidence is there in the forecast. Yeah. So if we've got the confidence in the forecast, we, we can go ahead, use the tools that we have on the, across all weather types apply the restrictions where our forecasters say to us actually this is a really uh, volatile situation it could go one way it could go the other yeah. um, then we need to make sure we're reviewing it you know yeah. more frequently right up to the event or right up to the day because um, things can change but the great thing there is the, the, the tools are being developed the models are being developed we're learning all the time and the objective of keeping as much of the railway open as we can we're starting to meet that that sounds like that's real progress yeah, I yeah. think we are we are making progress. Yeah. Um, although we are battling against climate change, which are, uh, you know that's going to increase our um, our challenges yeah. with respect to weather resilience um, over the coming decades. Mm. So there's Chipping Sodbury Tunnel, yeah. Yeah. And so, okay. Yeah. So that's uh, Swindon that way, yeah. Bristol Parkway behind us. Yeah. Um, and when it's flooded here, we have water pouring out of kind of out of the ground, springs within the tunnel, and then in this track here, and then it kind of just flows downhill behind us. Wow. Um, it, like the railway's acting as a huge drainage channel for the, <laughs> for the local catchment area. Good grief. And that's because it's built through this aquifer that you were describing earlier? Yes. Right. Yes. So, yeah, so there's, there's all kind of, um, it's, it's an oolite um, aquifer with kind of with cast which is kind of you know, lots of um, different voids and channels oh, so, wow. so when, when it gets to a certain level you know flows that we don't understand happen and suddenly it, it will burst forth through the, the, the floor of the tunnel. Second stop was Seven Tunnel Junction where Nick and I looked at some of the work he carried out in recent times on vegetation control. We chatted about the challenges of securing licenses for such work and we had a surprise visitor in the form of network rails measurement train. The challenge with vegetation, it's a multi-agency task, isn't it? You can't yes. just go and no. 
chop the trees down. No, we need to make sure we've got the appropriate licenses for ecology, which I completely understand. Yeah. We do take that responsibility very seriously, but it makes it very difficult. In order to plan on the railway, you've obviously got possessions, people, uh, machinery, um, and in order to sequence that efficiently, the licensing side of it is a key part of that. Yeah. And you need to be able to determine um, when you're going to get your license. Yeah. And you can't always do that. So what's the process? So say you, you want to um, cut back what we've just seen here at Seven Tonner Junction. Yeah. What, what are the steps? What do you actually have to do? So we do um, uh, obviously pre-surveys, right. risk assessments, so yeah. we, uh, and, then, and then we apply for our license. Yeah. Um, and then within 40 days, um, we get a response. You'd like to think that the response would say, off you go, crack yeah. on. But, but I understand why that doesn't always, so th there may be further questions. So, so you submit your evidence, you submit your survey uh, and your management plan, um, and then there may be further inquiries. That you but have. What, what happens if you only get that back on day 35? Uh, you're in trouble. Everything starts to go out of sequence. Jesus. So if you look at the cost of contractors, or yeah. if you look at your possessions where you've to stop the trains to go in, which yeah. you negotiate in advance, um, everything goes out of sequence. It becomes very, very difficult to, um, to, to keep that, um, that programme uh, effective and efficient. One of, one of the real challenges we've got there at the moment is ash dieback. Yeah. Um, and I know that's a real, a real issue. Surely that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? We just basically you just chop it down because the, the, the stuff's dead. But is, is it as straightforward as that? It, it's, it's not as straightforward as that. So you, in the Wells and Borders route here, so we're obviously at Seven Tunnel Junction yeah. here, and we, I, as far as Hollyhead and yeah. just sh short of Merseyside, we've got 30,000 ash trees that are dead or dying. 30,000? And that's inside the railway fence. Inside the railway fence. Oh if you look at how do you actually get to those trees that are dying in amongst the, um, the habitat that's there already, yeah. um, you need to be able to get to them to bring them down. Yeah. So, so if you look at... Um, the management of the of the line side in order to get to the trees that are dead to get them down, that is a that is a plan in itself. So yeah. the the line side management um, is a, a quite a complex task in order to get to those trees. Yeah. So we need a more uh, you know we really do need a more strategic approach to the line side, taking our responsibility seriously, obviously, yeah. um, but we need to be able to um, offset habitat more effectively outside of the railway fence. Um, we need to be able to use the finite resources that we've got um, in, a, in a more efficient way um, and we can reinvest some of that efficiency in tree planting. In, I mean, we've just been to somewhere where you've seen that. Yeah. Um, so we need a, a much more strategic approach where we clear the line side yeah. because trains and trees don't mix. Um, we recognise that there may be some compromises that we have to make with habitats, but we more than offset that away from the railway. So one of the things you, you, we were chatting a bit uh, about earlier, which I had not understood at all, is that you mentioned there's 30,000 trees inside the railway boundary, but yeah. when you uh, get um, an ecology uh, permit, you have to replace that habitat inside the railway boundary. I mean, that's a, yeah. that just, but that's just an arbitrary thing. That doesn't really seem to make any sense. It's, um, the railway's a long, narrow, linear corridor. Yeah. Um, and we're constrained for space. Yeah. Um, naturally. So um, offsetting is difficult. It's expensive. Yeah. It creates logistical complexity. Um, so that, we need a more strategic approach to recognising that inside the railway fence, whilst there will be habitats that we have to protect, and I completely understand that, yeah, yeah. The, the, um, the, we, we, we should be uh, promoting safe, low carbon transport methods yeah. to stop people using the M4 that yeah. we can hear behind us. Yeah. That is by far the biggest carbon reduction that we can all um, facilitate. But then we reinvest that efficiency um, by being able to manage the line side by creating habitats the other side of the railway fence. Yeah, or, yeah, absolutely. One of the things I had also not understood, Nick, was just cost. So the cost of uh, dealing with a tree um, varies enormously depending on where it is in its, I say, life cycle, I suppose, in its sort of death cycle, really. What, yeah. what's, what sort of ratios are we talking about? So. And ash, so the, the ash population, 90% of it, I'm informed, will die. Yeah. So it's an inevitability. Yeah. We can't change that. That's, that's a given. 
Um, it takes somewhere between three and four years for an ash tree to, to from a very healthy ash tree to become a, an yeah. ash tree where you can't climb it. In the early stages of ash dieback, we can take a tree down uh, for about 200 pounds based on a kind of root based clearance. Yeah. So um, you, you, you clear many on one mob mobilization. If you leave the tree to the point where you can't climb it, and there's a risk that it may fall on the railway when it's open because you can't determine what's going to happen with it, that can rise to 5,000 pound a tree. So that's, if you look that's at, so a, that's if a factor you, of 25. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> um, so, and the other thing as well is you can't wait until that tree is four years old before you take it down. No. As, a, as in the, 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 the ash dieback. Um, Recognising that um, there are 30,000, you can't go up to that place and then across to that place waiting no. for the trees to kind of get to the point where there's nothing left. Yeah. You've got to take a more strategic approach, clear the line side. So since this is all trees. absolutely so since this is all public money, yeah. let's have a genuinely strategic multi-agency approach, which will also save us a vast amount of money, keep the railway clear, yeah. and and you know stop some of the incidents that we've seen where trees come down. I mean, tree hitting a, a, a cab of a, of a train is a really it's a bad thing for it's the service, dangerous. but it's desperate for the poor person that's driving it as well. Lethally dangerous, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, uh, and, you know, wow. I, I also think, you know, working together, we can create more net gain um, with, the, with the resources that we've got yeah. if we work together. And not only that, a more reliable and safe transport system where people can choose to leave the car behind, Perfect. especially during high winds. Yeah. Uh -huh. What's this coming in here? Yeah. And uh, as if by magic. Ah. The measurement train. It's remarkable that, isn't it? I mean, I've just seen, uh, just seen that rear power car there with John Armit's name on yeah. it. He was um, very much instrumental in bringing that onto the railway, and. Uh, I remember taking um, Alistair Darling on it. We yep. went on it once, and he was absolutely blown away by, you know, monitoring the pantograph and Absolutely. looking at yep. the, the camera on the wheel rail yep. interface yep. and just seeing it go over yep. P and C. It was just fantastic stuff. We, we don't patrol 14,000 plain line miles of the railway now. So we use plain line pattern recognition on yeah. trains like that that run every four. So that train will run like that every fourth Friday. Yeah, okay. superb. And then, and then um, we have got to get the defect count per kilometre down yeah. to enable to switch on that functionality. Yeah. But then we rely on the the, uh, the outputs from that train because it's got predictive yeah. uh, geometry type technology. Fantastic. That's how it should it, be. It, it's just superb. Yeah. Really, really transformational. Yeah, brilliant. Final stop on our trip was Brinny Gwyn and Foot Crossing near Llanharan, Bridge End, South Wales. We looked here at the real world consequences of red tape that can prevent essential vegetation clearance from being carried out, resulting in this case in a speed restriction that's been in place for a number of years. The speed restriction has a direct and negative impact on the railway's ability to do its job properly, ironically. It's an environmental issue that is preventing the most effective use of the ultimate environmentally sound and low carbon transport solution of all. So, Nick, where are we here, apart, apart from a foot crossing in the middle of, uh, in the middle of Wales? So we're near Llanharan yeah. in South Wales, so yeah. not far from Bridge End. Okay. And this foot crossing is Brunigwinan foot crossing. Uh, it's a, a two-track railway, very typical. Yep. And the line speed and the timetabled speed is 75 miles per hour. However, on the upline, so from Swansea to London, you can travel, the trains can travel at 75 miles per hour. Yep. On the downline, which is the line furthest away from us, so trains heading for Swansea, um, we have a temporary speed restriction on the, uh, which obviously delays trains. Um, the what's, what's that speed restriction? So the speed restriction is 50 miles an hour. 50, right. Uh, the published line speed is 75. So yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's a delay. Yeah. Um, the reason for that is um, in order to traverse the crossing, it takes time. Yeah. 
And then in order to provide safe time to traverse the crossing, you need sighting distance. Yeah. If we look that in that direction, there's curved track. Yeah. Uh, and the curvature of the track and the sighting distance is obscured by line side vegetation. So, and, we're, and, and we're not allowed to move it. Ah, I, I knew there was going to be a catch yeah, somewhere. There's a butt, yeah. yeah. We're not allowed to move the vegetation. Um, and that's not because we don't want to. Right. It's because uh, we have not been granted a licence and therefore we're not permitted to. And the reason for uh, what, what, what it actually is, is it just because you need a licence for any treatment? Is there anything specific in there? So, the in order to manage the line side yeah. and our environmental legal responsibilities, um, we apply for licences to right. manage uh, diseased trees, um, drainage um, and vegetation. And there are protected species which we care about yeah. um, and they exist near railway infrastructure. Is that the issue there then? And that's what's happened there, yeah. So right. what, what it is is dormice. So there is, uh, a, a, in our early surveys, you can see that there's a, a presence of dormice yeah. and therefore uh, we will not be granted the licence to manage that until such time that um, uh, the risk of, of dormice in terms of hibernation and things right. uh, has passed. And therefore, the only way that we can manage is by putting a temporary speed restriction on. And if I'm right, one of the things you've got to do on the railway is if you are moving habitats yeah. like that, you've actually got to replace the habitat within the boundary of the railway. So um, every licence is, is unique. Right. So every location is unique. Um, and so the license when it's granted will have certain um, conditions. Certain conditions. Um, typically, we will have to um, offset habitats so recreate habitat. Yeah. Um, and if you look at uh, providing continuity, um, often that um, offsetting is inside the railway fence. The railway is a narrow corridor yeah. um, where we haven't got lots of space. That, that um, creates logistical complexity, cost. We need resource contractors or our own staff. We need access, safe access to the railway, which takes time to plan. Yeah. And then you need the license. You bring all that together and you've got a plan that yeah. you can then do the work. If you cannot depend on your license, um, then you miss your possession. Your contractors can't be used so it all starts to get uh, quite complex and inefficient so if you look in this area here we were granted a license and we're grateful for that yeah. to manage the diseased trees the you trees, can see yeah. here we've taken the tops off yeah and we've left the bottoms down because that helps with habitat yeah. offsetting and things like that but the, the risk of them falling on the tra track is is dealt with yeah um, but our contractors came and did so much yeah. and then they had to stop yeah and there and the, but that that the other risk is, is, is still there. So we've got yeah. multiple risks here. We've got obviously the risk of trees falling, but we've dealt with that. Um, but this, this particular risk that is causing us to have to put this temporary speed on is, you can't see. We, we need to think slightly differently. We, we care for the environment, I care for the environment. I'm yeah. not for one minute saying that we should play fast and loose. But we need to come up a level together, yeah. all of us, and think, We've got to reduce carbon, we've got to create reliable low carbon journeys and therefore what needs to be true for that to happen so that people are confident to leave their cars at home yeah. or put freight on railways um, and that is by running a reliable timetable and therefore yeah. helping us to manage things there is like a bit, this. Yeah. There is a bit of good news here though. <laughs> They're building a load of new houses. Yeah, they are. So there's a new grade separated bridge going there in. Is, yeah. And when that's open, this, this can close and presumably then that is problem solved, but that has taken a long time. This temporary speed restriction has been here for years. Gee, it was. Years. Yeah. So indeed, I mean, I take level crossing safety very seriously mm. indeed. Um, it, it's vitally important that we do. Um, and, and we've worked with Persimmon, we've worked with the local councils yeah. and we are creating a um, bridal way network here that's great separate, separate from the road. We're doing that together. Yeah. Uh, that's a real win for the community. Yeah, so that's, that's great. great. Yeah. But with regard to uh, the line side vegetation there, our track workers still need to be able to walk on the line side. Yeah. They need to do that in a separated fashion. Yeah. Um, we, up there, there will be diseased trees. 
yeah. there will be disease trees yeah. that we can't treat. Yeah. We can't get to them. Yeah. So we've still got to deal with that problem, albeit the public will be safer yeah. because they'll be able to cross a bridge. So part of the problem solved, not still not it. quite fixed it. And ironically, the problem that's left is the operational safety yeah. risk. Yeah. Well, Nick, here, here we are at Bridge End, uh, at the end of what's been an absolutely brilliant trip. I mean, I, I can't say how, I'm so grateful. You know, we've seen all the flood attenuation stuff and the the lagoon at Chipping Sobbury and seeing the work that's been done there. Yeah. Talked so much about vegetation management and the challenges there, being up, um, obviously, Seven Tunnel, yeah. seen it um, on a real live bit of row with the challenges there. So I certainly feel hugely, uh, hugely more in, informed. Um, and what's brilliant about it is you just see the challenges that you're facing every day. If you could, I suppose, wave a magic wand and, and sort of fix, I don't know, two or three really big issues that would just transform, I suppose, transform the railway and the ability to operate it reliably, yeah. what, would they, what would they be? So, first, I'm glad you've enjoyed your day. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, the first thing, we spoke of it earlier, um, I've got no desire to cut corners, yeah. but I do think in terms of creating the maximum gain from the railway, yeah. we need to go up a level in how we're managing the line side and our environmental responsibilities. Yeah. I think we can do more to provide um, habitat offsetting. I think we can take trees down uh, that are dead uh, cheaper if we all act at a, uh, a more strategic yeah. level together. And I'm talking... Um, the licensing authorities, I'm talking government, I'm talking our contractor supply chain and yeah. ourselves. So that's, that's got to be one where we've got a clear opportunity. Yeah, that's very clear. Um, the next one then, in terms of climate resilience, um, there is some fantastic technology out there now, um, and we've seen some of it today. Yeah. Um, but if you look at intelligent infrastructure, forecasting, the way we communicate with trains and drivers, all those sorts of things, um, introducing technology into the railway is difficult, okay, for lots of reasons, okay. But if we are going to keep the railway one foot in front of the risk that we're being presented, we've got to embrace technology and deploy yeah. it uh, much more simply. Um, the third thing I would say is, um, if you look at um, providing a resilient and reliable railway system, um, there are, there are some simple solutions. And I think we've also, as well as some of the big schemes, we saw Chip in Sobri today, uh, we've talked about Dawlish, I've talked about the Seven Estuary, but there are some simple schemes. Um, and I would invite all engineers, of which I am one, to think about those. We, we, we used to lower cesses, we used to create soakaways, simple things that don't need a design, need somebody with a bit of now some common sense yeah. to make sure that the water stays away from the permanent way so that when we do get rain and we're getting more rain and more heavier rain, yeah. it doesn't stop the railway. Sure. And I guess it leads to me to the final thing um, there. Um, so I see different approaches to running a railways during inclement weather uh, when it comes to flood water. And um, there are, like I said, there are differences between different companies and different, uh, uh, different infrastructure managers. We've got to come together, the industry, because there will be a best way of, of keeping trains running um, during inclement weather, and we've got to find out what those are and do those. You know, I'll, I'll leave that with you. But that's an absolutely brilliant point to leave it on. Your, your chief executive, Andrew Haynes, said, the, I think, one of the most insightful things of all that I've heard said in the last 12 months after the incident that happened recently at Paddington. He said, I'm concerned that multiple actors all seeing risks and things from their different perspectives. Yeah. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. Getting together and seeing it from one perspective, which yeah. is ultimately a safe, boring, reliable, predictable railway, it's got to be the way, isn't There it? will be a best way yeah. amongst all of those ways. Absolutely. Let's do that. Nick, thanks so much. Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers. Well, I've just got back home, um, just in the, uh, in the farmyard here. And I thought before I got out, I'd um, just reflect on what I've seen today. I've been thinking about it on the way back from... Uh, South Wales in the rain 
And so it was really interesting to see, you know, the lagoon at Chipping Sodbury and um, see what they're doing uh, around uh, the Gusto um, sort of software program. That was really interesting. But I think the thing that really surprised me about today, what I wasn't expecting, was this licensing regime. What I was astonished about was just how much you have to do in order to get these licenses. You have to have a license to work. You know, no, no license, no work. And if you work without one, you can be prosecuted personally. It seems absolutely crazy to me that to be able to chop down um, ash trees that are that are either dying or dead. Um, so that you can improve sight lines for the safe use of a level crossing, but keeping at the line speed, you've got to submit all this paperwork and then they've got 40 days to reply. And, you know, what do they do if on day 39 they give you a load more questions? I mean, some of these licenses are taking ages. I mean, I think some of these licenses are taking years. You know, they find evidence of a of door mice and habitat, that's all got to be taken into account. And that's, look, that's fair enough. We, it's important that we protect the environment and we, and we care about this stuff. But I wonder now if the time is for Network Rail to be allowed to, in effect, self-certify. They do that with other things, with the safety critical matters. Why can't they do it with this? They've got the ecologists, they've got the people, so they carry out the surveys, they do it properly. Um, they take all the environmental factors into account. If they want to be able to replace habitat somewhere else, uh, why, sh why should it be that they've got to replace the habitat on their own land? It's a tiny, narrow piece of railway. Take doesn't take up that much space. You know that that also seems crazy. I think one of the things that though absolutely blows me away every time I go out on the railway is the people you meet. Um, you know they're they're brilliant. They're, they're committed, they're hardworking, they're straightforward, they're really, really able. And um, that's been my experience today. I mean, I've been love spending time with Nick and, and Julie. I mean, Nick's extraordinary. I mean, just so much energy, so much passion, so much commitment, so much care. We were talking a bit off camera about, you know, some of the other things he, he's doing and thinks about. And I just like, this is amazing. You know, we, we, we're lucky to have people. Uh, like that. So, look, I, it's been a fantastic day. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, thanks to Network Rail. Thanks to Nick. Thanks to, to Julie. Thanks to everybody that's helped make it possible. Anyway, I think it's uh, time for a cup of tea and um, we'll call it a day. Hope you've enjoyed it and see you soon.